Hello and welcome to Stand With Us Live. Stand With Us is working around the clock and around the world, supporting Israel and fighting anti-Semitism. Thank you for joining us on Stand With Us TV Live. We have a great show for you today. I am joined by the UCLA Chancellor's Professor of Computer Science and the Director of UCLA Cognitive System Laboratory, Professor Judea Pearl. Professor Pearl and his wife, Ruth, are the co-founders of the Daniel Pearl Foundation in memory of their son, Daniel Pearl the Jewish American journalist who was kidnapped and murdered by terrorists in Pakistan in 2002. The foundation seeks to use Daniel's life as a symbol to promote journalism, East-West understanding, and to combat hate. Professor Judea Pearl is known internationally for his contributions to artificial intelligence, human reasoning, and philosophy of science, and he is the recipient of numerous scientific awards, every possible prize in artificial intelligence, including the 2012 ACMAM Turing Award, which is generally recognized as the Nobel Prize in Computing. He is also a proud Israeli American, lecturer, and writes frequently on Jewish identity, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the history of Zionism and Israel on campus. Joining us live from Los Angeles, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce my good friend, Dr. Judea Pearl. Welcome, Judea. Welcome, Rose. Glad to be on your show again. Thank you so much for being with us. So let's begin with the question that's on everybody's mind. It's been 20 years now since uh, the murder of uh, your son, Daniel. Uh, and uh, everybody's wondering what's going on with the Pakistani court. They're talking about releasing uh, you know, several people involved in that murder. Can you shed some light on it? Yeah, the ruling of the Supreme Court was to uh, let uh, all the four suspects uh, go free and immediately. Uh, among them, of course, was the instigator, the, uh, the spirit behind the abduction, which is Omar Sheikh, who uh, planned it all, schemed it all, and uh, get it to, um, to the point, uh, the tragic point that it did. And we do not really understand the idea why Pakistan at this day and age have decided to send this message. And um, from what we understand, the government of Pakistan is appealing it and um, has placed the four suspects, they took them out of the death cell and um, keep them currently in a special quarters in Karachi prison, special quarters that was specially constructed in their honor and uh, waiting for Supreme Court um, revision. We appealed for revision. You cannot appeal a Supreme Court decision, but you can ask for revision of a decision and expanded court, namely, we would like to add three more judges um, to the three that decided you know, what they did. What they did. Um, also, there is an option here there of extra extradition, which we hope uh, the United States government will pursue vigorously. And we know that um, Tony Blinken has made a phone call to his um, parallel to the uh, Pakistani um, uh, foreign minister, um, expressing to him the urgency of the matter and the U.S. position, and I believe also raise the possibility of extraditing Omar Sheikh to stand trial here in America 
for crimes that he did against American citizens, not only Daniel Pearl, but also other tourists. He specialized in luring to, in abducting tourists. It was uh, his uh, chosen profession. And um, yeah, so that is also an option, which we hope will be clarified soon. Thank you for that. And uh, we see Daniel's uh, picture right behind you. And I was wondering if you have a message for the Pakistani government about all of this? The message is, uh, you know, Pakistani still have a chance to save its face. And I hope you take this uh, option and um, send a message of uh, justice to the rest of the world. Com complying with the hopes and expectation that we, me and my wife, have built regarding the future of Pakistan. And we let ourselves believe very strongly that um, Pakistan has managed to contain, to control its extreme element. We were extremely disappointed, disappointed if not betrayed by our own expectation to understand how profoundly rooted the extremists are in Pakistan, the uh, conspiracy theories that still take hold in the mindset of good Pakistani people and the urgency that the, some elements in the Pakistani society has to despise to uh, confront the West and and to ascertain their independence and their uh, sovereignty in a very uh, unbecoming way, to send a message of impunity to the entire world, to would-be terrorists and would-be abductors of additional um, journalists. And this is our message. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. You know, um, Judea, people care so much about you and your family and what happened to you. Uh, they wonder how they can be helpful. They wonder if there's anything at all that they can do. Uh, can you give us some guidance about how we can put hands on and be supportive? Uh, the easiest way and the straightforward way is to contribute to our legal defense fund which, as you can imagine, is not a trivial matter. We have a very good uh, Pakistani lawyer, but his expenses and, uh, are something that is uh, not trivial for us to uh, handle. And uh, the, the way to get there is uh, um, just type uh, danielpearlproject.org. And you'll find a way of contributing to the Legal Defense Fund. Okay, uh, good. Uh, thank you for that. And maybe we could put it up on the screen. Uh, you said danielpearlproject.org. Correct. Uh, and we'll remind people at the end also, at the end of today's show. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we know we'd like to, we would like to help. And maybe uh, if you can think of other ways uh, letters that people can write, uh, anything that, that would be helpful in advocacy, please do let us know and we can help you at Stand With Us. Uh, of course, it would be our pleasure. So we have people joining us today from all over the world, Judea. They want to hear you uh, and they want to hear what you have to say about Zionophobia, which we're going to be talking about soon, and about being a pro-Israel professor on college campuses. So if you're out there and want to let us know where you're coming from or give us a question, please put it in the comments section and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So our first question today is, uh, what is it like to be a pro-Israel professor at UCLA? First, I'm a professor of computer science 
True. <laughs> I deal, I deal with equations more than I deal with the social matters. And um, but I can tell you that uh, I've been a professor at UCLA for the past uh, 51 years, and I have been uh, witnessing with sadness and helplessness uh, the way um, the climate. Uh, um, campus climate uh, deteriorated uh, through the years and how institutionalized anti-Israel sentiment became. I say institutionalized because I think it began in about 2000 with the first intifada. Uh, we lost the, the Center for Near East Study. It used to be a place of uh, exchange of idea about the Middle East, including Israel. And suddenly, unilaterally, the center decided to erase Israel from the map of the Middle East. The second was the history department with the influx of vitriol <clears throat> anti-Israel professors. Then we saw the Center for Jewish Studies not hostile, but simply and strange to Israel. I don't know how many of the students know that Israel is part of the uh, Jewish world. Um, then we saw this: the Office of uh, um, Equity and Diversity and Inclusion, which should uh, theoretically be supportive of a Jewish student become unwilling to um, classify Zionism as part of uh, Jewish students' identity and shelved the decision by the regents who decided, who came out with a resolution uh, that the majority of uh, uh, Jewish students Israel and Zionism constitutes a central part of their identity. And the Office of Equity, Diversity of Inclusion was in charge of implementing it, but it was shelved. And um, then we all remember the recent incidents where the anthropology department has invited the speaker who blamed Zionists for being um, uh, white supremacist, and so on and so on. Let me give you some personal outlook. Perhaps it's typical of other universities as well. We have 600 Jewish faculty, just about, maybe uh, 650 Jewish faculty among about 4,000 total uh, faculties. And these 600 Jewish faculties are divided to 200, 200, and 200. 200 are warm Zionists in the open. The other 200 in the middle are a closet Zionists waiting for an excuse to come out. And the other 200 are uh, conversos. I, I don't have any other words. But if you imagine uh, Noam Finkelstein type, okay, uh, Noam, uh, uh, Noam Chomsky, and then um, the type, okay. So 200 are lost, but the other 400 constitute a tremendous potential, and it needs to be leveraged. And unfortunately, it is not yet. It's a tremendous opportunity because when you get students and faculty working together, it's unstoppable power. The faculty constitute the continuity in the university. Students come and go. The faculty provide experience, knowledge, connections, and continuity. And they present the image of the university. And the students have a tremendous clout because when the student faculty says, I am here to, to defend my students, it carries 10 times more power than a faculty makes an appointment with the chancellor. Okay? 
So the opportunity there is tremendous. Unfortunately, there are forces of division. And we are currently working on uh, mitigating those forces. One force, for instance, is Hillel, which is, is the major address for every Jewish student on campus, right? Well, Hillel is not faculty oriented. It was founded to be a home away from home for Jewish students, not faculty, okay? And th that tradition is in, um, is a challenge. It needs to be reversed. I'll give you an example. In the, in the Hillel website, you wouldn't find a faculty corner, which would give a faculty um, um, a microphone to talk to their students about issues which concerns uh, Jewish life on campus. When I want to communicate with Jewish students on campus, I have to write an op-ed in a Jewish journal. It's my only way of communicating with them. Of course, it varies from campus to campus, and it depends to a great extent on the uh, personality of the Hillel director. And some are very, very interested in developing a fa Jewish a student faculty relationship. I can mention, for instance, in uh, Silicon Valley, okay, we have a tremendous collaboration between Jewish uh, students and faculty. So this is the situation, and I am very excited about the two initiatives which have just been uh, announced and um, just surfaced. One is a group call, calling itself New Zionist Congress, grassroots student organization, which put on its flag the uh, mission of collaborating with faculty to, to uh, provide both um, ideological, historical, and basis for Zionist students on campus. And the other one is the collaboration between the academic engagement network uh, headed by uh, um, uh, Mark Yudov and Hillel International. This has a potential of breaking the uh, division be between faculty and uh, students. And um, if such a collaboration occurred in your campus, okay, it would be a tremendous uh, advantage uh, and something to watch carefully how that initiative is progressing. And I can give you three litmus tests. I love litmus tests because they are, they are something you can measure, it's concrete, you can bite into it, and they signify a tremendous amount of everyday activity. Well, here are the three litmus tests to how successful your uh, Jewish leadership is in your campus. One, the number of students that participate in your Matzma'ut, Israeli Independence Day. Okay. This is a day which is the least controversial from all the days all, all celebration you can think of. You have here a symbol which is a symbol of unity for all, for all Jews. Okay? And the degree of participation and the elaboration of that event measure the degree to which Hillel and the Jewish leadership in your community devote to Israel. Okay. In some places, it's just frisbee and falafel. In other places, it's a deep celebration with lectures, with songs, and with a feeling of pride. Okay. So that's litmus test number one. And litmus test number two, you guessed correctly, it's the number of faculty 
participating in Yom Ha'atzma'ut. Last Yom Ha'atzma'ut, I think I was the only faculty at UCLA that came to the celebration. <laughs> and it shows, it, sh it reflects not only Yom Ha'atzma'ut, but the work done throughout the years, the degree of understanding and the cultivation of the relationship between student and faculty. You cannot call faculty overnight to come and celebrate Yom Ha'atzma'ut. It must reflect a yearly effort. So I'm telling, I'm saying here, I'm presenting it as litmus test number two and litmus test number three. The number of times the word Zionist or Zionism appear in the administration official statements. You'll be surprised, but rarely you will find the word Zionism appearing in any official statement is being treated like a, a taboo or even worse, like a radioactive contaminant. Okay. And for a reason that we will elaborate soon, but uh, <clears throat> and the, the success of Jewish leadership should be measured by the degree to which they can persuade the administration to pronounce the word Zionism. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I hope everybody shares my uh, sense of feeling honored to be able to listen to all your ideas on this because I asked a simple question and you really presented a lot of uh, solutions, solutions to uh, the issue of you know, being a professor on campus that teaches computer science, but is also a Zionist. I mean, there's so much that you said that I'd like to dig deeper into. Um, for example, you mentioned the 200, 200, and 200 formula of professors. So are you in touch with the other pro-Israel professors? Uh, do, you, do you talk about, do you lament about the problems that you see? And also, can you address, um, is, is the Silicon Valley the only Hillel that has a faculty section on their website? Uh, or are there other Hillels? Because it, it sounds like such a no-brainer idea for involving and, and uh, helping students interact with the pro-Israel professor community on their campuses. I... I assume there are others. From my dealing with the various healers, there are others. I haven't checked this litmus test about the existence of a faculty corner on the website, but it's something which is necessary. We had few incidents where we want to communicate with the students and we couldn't. So this is a difficulty that healer um, has by tradition. You know, they are not geared. They are geared to do Shabbat dinner for students away from home and not for faculty. So it is a tradition that must be changed and will be changed. Um, the 200 warm faculty are not organized in any way. The faculty hates to be organized, especially these days with cancel, cancel, cancel. If you say a wrong word or you, you find yourself as a member of organization with somebody else who happened to say a wrong word to a wrong minority, right? You might be blamed for life and you wouldn't be elected to a committee. So faculty is automatically by their nature resistance to organization. But we have a email list such that I can communicate with these 200 professor when, when actions need to be taken on campus when urgency surfaces. We do communicate. I wish it will be done more, I would say, organizationally, institutionally, but uh, we cannot overcome this resistance. The best way is for the uh, Jewish leadership to provide the bridges that we need so that we can work together with uh, students. 
it is a, a profound, uh, simple request. It's profound and simple. Uh, it seems like a, a, a no-brainer again, uh, but that that uh, Jewish professors or non-Jewish professors who are pro-Israel should be able to communicate with one another. Uh, you know, what what is everybody afraid of? What is preventing all that, uh, Judea? You have such great ideas. Yes, I have my own opinion. I don't want to uh, <laughs> impose my um, folk psychology on some of the uh, our leaders. That some faculty are uh, more confrontational than need need be. Uh, you know that he and the, and the entire leadership, Jewish leadership, thrives on collaboration and thrives on the appearance that everything is fine because they need to continue the flow of funding. They need to continue the flow of students to convince Jewish students, uh, parents to send their kids to the university. This is a major force and I understand them. And um, so any appearance of um, uh, confrontation or hostility on campus disturbs this appearance of everything is fine and we are doing great. No? I understand this conflict and it has to be balanced. That, I believe, is the main reason why we have reluctance to collaborate with uh, faculty, especially faculty like me, who are openly Zionists. Not a closet Zionist, but proud, proudly so. Uh, we th thank you for, for all of that and your openness about all this. Uh, we understand these are your opinions, uh, and but we just want to hear. We want to hear your opinions. Uh, speaking of which, can you tell us what your sense is about the administration? And uh, it, can you also elaborate not just about your administration, but what you see, because you're watching, you're watching what's going on in the country. Uh, and obviously we're watching what's going on in other countries as well in this issue. Uh, what do you think the role of administration is? Uh, what do you think uh, about how responsive they are to student issues regarding Zionism and, and fa failures? What are your thoughts? That's very important, yes. So let me start by giving you my opinion about administrators in general, okay? And this is something that every one of us must understand. The president of university and chancellors care only about two things and two things only. Number one, funding. Number two, ranking of the university. Because that is the legacy that a president of university leaves when he or she leaves office, okay? How successful he or she was in building another institute, in raising the ranking of the university from number nine to number eight. It's a great achievement. Okay, now, as you can understand, the hostility and the... Um, I should say, really, the um, the circus that BDS creates on campus is not helping any of the administrators achieve these two goals, ranking and donation. Okay. What they don't understand, so there, there are basically interested in getting the, the BDS hostilities down to some level of tolerance. What they are missing is the secret weapon by which they can accomplish it overnight. Here is the second weapon. It is content-based denunciation. Right now, they work on the principle of content uh, neutral, which means they don't see uh, they don't see that they have a right to comment on any uh, hate speech. 
because their role is only to handle the um, logistics of the speaker and whether or not the um, in, uh, institute that invited the speaker was uh, appropriately registered and so on, logistics. But they call it content neutral. And this is wrong and this is simply not true. They have the option of being content based. I'll give you an example. When Milo Yiannopoulos uh, came to campus and made his spiel against a Mexican, he just doesn't like Mexican for some reason, okay? The um, Chancellor Drake, okay, came out with a very important message to the campus. He said, I can't stop you. I can't stop you. You have the right to speak here because you were properly invited by a proper organization. However, I have the right, right to tell you what I think about you. And let me tell you that you are not welcome on our campus because your values are not our values. Very simple declaration. Okay? And it worked in the case of Milo Yiannopoulos. It worked even at UCLA, where Chancellor Block said, you know, that the day after uh, Milos Yiannopoulos came here, the Chancellor came out with um, elaborate, elaborate listing of all the contribution the Latinos made, the Latino community made in our to Los Angeles, to California, to our country, okay? and so on and so on. It's a very tricky and very powerful weapon. Why? Because it retains free speech and at the same time allows the lead administration, administrator to set norms of discourse, which is part of the administrator's charter. So they are very good in handling it, or they are learning to handle it in the case of Latinos and other minorities. They are totally ignorant of how to handle it in the case of Jewish minority. They have not experienced it. And this is something totally new for them. I feel for them how amateur they are, not knowing that they can stop this whole BDS Purim spiel overnight. But the Jewish leadership is partly responsible for their ignorance because they are waiting to find, to get a draft uh, statement from the Jewish leadership. They don't know how to express it. They don't know how to write it in such a way that it will be effective and uh, at the same time uh, comply with the requirement of free speech, free speech. The Jewish leadership should feed them that draft letter or draft statement, and they don't. And let me now tell you why they don't. And let me tell you who did. Two examples exist where the Jewish leadership was more active and were successful. One is uh, Marta Pollack, who is the president of uh, Cornell. And when the BDS made the um, annual request for divestment, okay, she came out with a very interesting statement. She said, she said, the BDS conflate, conflate, um, criticism of Israel policy with the right of Israel to exist, something which I found extremely troublesome. Now, two things about it. Number one, she said, I found, I, the president of Co Cornell, I find it a personal touch. I find it extremely powerful. And second, she talks about the right of Israel to exist, which should be a moral imperative. The campus has not had it. Our campus have not held it from our chancellor. 
that two things are important and if the Jewish leadership is successful in, do, in doing their job, it would be to give this draft to the administrator who is totally amateurish and give them a way out of the predicament. Okay. The second was University of Michigan. The president came out with a statement that for the majority of Jewish students, Israel and Zionism is a central part of their identity. That is a declaration that it's not taking side. It's not something that should not be any taboo here. Even, even the uh, vicious lawyers of care will not uh, criticize the president or the chancellor for making such a statement. And it, it is part of the duty of the Jewish leadership to work together with the administrator to make this kind of simple statement, making sure to the campus that Israel's existence is a moral imperative and siding with that imperative is not taking side. It's being honest. Well, it's also dividing the issue, dividing the issue of any complaints you have about any policies. Of course, many, many of those uh, complaints uh, are blood libel issues, so we have to take those out of the formula. But regular complaints about policies are one thing. Uh, the very existence of the state of Israel is another. But I want to bring up IRA. We are very actively involved in making sure that the IRA, the International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Alliance, will be accepted by universities because it has a definition that university administrators can use and draw from so that each time something happens, the Jewish community doesn't have to come up with a new definition and a new statement. They can draw from the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, like what you talked about, that, that Israel is a big part of Jewish identity, and then uh, they can go from there. They can draw from it. It's a definition. It's not a legal issue. It's a definition that will be helpful uh, in this issue. Judea, I know you want to talk about something very important, and I don't want to run out of time uh, before we do it, and that is your ideas about using the term Zionophobia and how to apply that uh, with what we're seeing on campus. Yes, it has to do with IRA definition. It has to do with the fact that anti-Semitism is a tired card. It is, in some sense, it is uh, um, it's used as a cover-up for inaction. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. Once hostility starts on campus, the administration um, exonerates itself from acting against the real issue, which is anti-Zionism, by referring to anti-Semitism. And they love to refer it to anti-Semitism because we have institutions that deal with it. We have philosophers that spend all their careers arguing what is and what is not anti-Semitism. So they love to de delegate the trouble to other people and exonerate themselves from handling the issue the way I described, the way Martha Pollack handled it in Cornell. Now, let me give you three scenarios just to exemplify. I'm sure that those scenarios occur in different phases or different level of manifestation in other campuses as well. i give you three scenarios. One was the appearance of uh, pseudo-professor Abdul Hadi um, in UCLA, where she accused Zionists of being a uh, white supremacist. Right? Now, immediately when the controversy developed, 
And the issue was, was it or wasn't it anti-Semitic? Two leaders, one is a rabbi and one is a professor of history, Jewish professor of history, rushed to the LA Times and issued a, a p opinion. No, it wasn't anti-Semitic. What does it do? It takes away the entire wind and the entire um, energy from all the people who are shout, uh, crying out for the administrators to take action, to at least ask Abdul Hadi to apologize to me and a thousand other students at UCLA for calling them white supremacists. This is, if you see, what happens is referral to anti-Semitism okay, neutralizes our energy to take action. I'll give you another example that you will see. Remember the case of Rose Rich, okay, who had to resign from her position as, as um, I think, uh, in, in the student government <clears throat> for being openly Zionist. And 43 professors, prominent professors, Nobel Prize winners, head of departments, members of the National Academy of uh, Science, okay, came out with a statement, we are Zionist, and enough is enough, and we demand to know if we are welcome on this campus. I'm paraphrasing it, but that's essentially what they said. What happens now? The administration answered with a very simple answer. We are going to take about, take care of the uh, anti-Semitism anti in our uh, campus. Anti-Semitism, they didn't mention anti-Zionism. And indeed, they appointed a task force. No one of the 43 professors was invited. Okay? And they made a panel. The panel about the success of the Jewish community in fighting the penetration of Nazis in 1939 into <laughs> and they congratulating themselves for being so successful in preventing uh, Hitler Jung from taking over Los Angeles. And they deserve a congratulation. But it took away the entire punch of this 43 professor who claimed we are Zionists, and we want to know if we are welcome. Not, not the Jewish issue, not anti-Semitic um, issue, but we have a pressing issue of knowing uh, whether we, as Israeli and Zionists, on the faculty of UC, are welcome. And they haven't received an answer. Another task force, and another task force for for vague notion, for uh, uh, arguing about the notion of anti-Semitism. A third scenario, if we have time, uh, uh, in um, UCI, just the past week, okay, passed a resolution in favor of BDS. After two decades of enormous, profound anti-Israel festivities, Every Yom Ha'atzmaut is the same week as the, Jew, as the Israel Independence Day. They have a hate festival, okay, about the about the um, um, a world without Israel, genocide in Palestine, and so on. They invented all these names. In you, after two decades of continuous harassment, okay, Chancellor Gilman take action. And what is the action? A town hall, okay, where he pitted two Jewish journalists from the New York Times, okay, against each other. What does it mean? What is the difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? Another philosophical discussion was cheered by the Jewish leadership. How creative, how creative. Okay. And then we are um, we are surprised 
that 19 to 2, the, the um, student government in UCI voted for BDS resolution. And look at the first sentence in the, in the BDS resolution. What was the first sentence? Whereas we love Jews. That was the first sentence. And we have nothing to do against Judaism. Right? And then comes 83, whereas, whereas, whereas Israel demolishes houses, whereas Israel commits suicide, uh, genocide, and so on and so on. Okay? This is the weakness of the anti Semitic card. It gives license for administrators to avoid the issue. I'll now go to the word xenophobia that you mentioned. The alternative to this card is the word xenophobia. The definition is very simple. It's obsessive denial of the right of the Jewish people to a sovereign, to a sovereign homeland. It's something you cannot deny even if you are extreme liberal. At the same time, what it, what it does for you, it snaps out the BDS trap into a court where we can win hands down. The court at the real core of the issue of the Israel-Palestinian conflict. And this is denial of the Jewish people, their basic right. It has many, many advantages that anti-Semitism does not have. Number one, it has an element of accusation, irrational. It's an obsessive denial. Number two, it rhymes with Islamophobia, which is a cardinal sin in today's uh, campuses. Okay? And three, it's a fighting word. If you are a xenophobe, if I call you a xenophobe, there's something wrong with you, not with me. And something very basic, very basically wrong, which is violating one of the general principles of liberalism, not of Jewish tradition, of liberal philosophy. And people will, will of course, uh, criticize me. How can you conflate um, Zionism, which is a political uh, movement with uh, something like Islamophobia, which is religion. Well, in modern day, religion doesn't have a monopoly on human sensitivity. Identity defining symbol should be equally respected regardless of they are based on history, based on collective memories or based on religion. There's nothing sacred about religion anymore. And I'm talking about liberal philosophers, consensus here. And number two, which is very important about the word, is, is xenophobia, which I've noticed in my experience dealing with Muslims and dealing with uh, anti-Zionist. It gets your BDS crony totally off balance. They do not know how to handle accusations of immorality. Their echo chamber have not prepared them to be accused of something as basic as racism. We, the racist, we, the angel of uh, of uh, social justice, yes, you have a stain on you. That's the idea of xenophobia. It's accusatory. It forces you to look at yourself in the mirror and judge whether you are really living up to your slogans. It's a tremendous power in this world. And I hope that we are going to use it more and more because if we use it more and more, it will become the ugliest word in town. And that's where it belongs. So 
We are running out of time, but I just want to say, just to uh, recap what you just gave us, the separation between anti-Semitism and Zionophobia uh, is important because it helps people focus and it doesn't distract them and bury the issue of Zionophobia. We understand now from you, the separation is very important. Also with IRA, I just wanna get back to that for a moment. When you read the definition of the IRA for anti-Semitism, it incorporates the Jewish identity, which includes Zionism. So it's very important that we also recognize that, Judea. I don't mean to disagree with you, but I just want to uh, remind everybody that the IRA definition of anti-Semitism incorporates Zionophobia. But I just want to underscore that that I know, Judea, it is a uh, a goal of yours that people begin to use the term and begin to have a harder separation between the two. So it makes it clearer on campus. So people have what to, you know, how they can discuss these issues in a clearer kind of way. We have some questions for you from students and from people around the world. And unfortunately, we're running out of time. So if you can give some quick, quick answers, that, that would be amazing. Let's try, okay? We have Shira from Sydney. She says, um, what do you think the anti-Israel movement or Zionophobia on college campuses, do you think that it's on the rise? Of course. Yes. Uh, 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 would you like me to quote some surveys and statistics? I'm not too good at that. No, it's of course I, I it's on the so. rise. Judea, I'm sorry. I think she's asking why. Why do you no, think? What? Why? Yes. Well, there have been an influx of um, anti-Israel uh, faculty into the U.S. That's one of the reasons. Okay. Um, there is also uh, an increased animosity in the uh, uh, extreme left part of the political spectrum against Israel. And this also has a very profound psychological uh, reasons, underlying reason. I blame it on uh, uh, Israel's success. Israel has defied the textbooks of all our leftist faculty. Its success becomes its um, uh, guilt and its sin. Anyhow, this is my psychological uh, explanation for why the left part, the left wing of the political spectrum is becoming more and more anti Israel. So, these two factors, I think, play a major role. Plus, let's not underestimate it. We have today allowed Enter Israel um, allowed the United States Congress to become a stage, a propaganda stage for two enter Israel Congress women. Let's not underestimate the impact on young people of that kind of uh, propaganda stage. It has a tremendous impact. Look at Rashida Talib. She will she will start talking about Israel even if you talk about income tax. Even if you can talk about uh, child pornography. Right? Continuous bombardment of enter Israel accusations. This we have allowed this to happen and that we should remember. We have to live with a new kind of environment. Well, the temple of our democracy, the United States Congress, is being used as a propaganda arena for anti-Israel accusation. 
thank you. Thank you for that. Let's try one more quick one. Um, the issue of intersectionality and uh, how our students, this is a question from Lior in Los Angeles. He says, um, what, what do you advise students to do when they feel like because of their Zionism, they're being pushed out of social justice movements on campus? They're made to feel uncomfortable. Uh, my advice for students is, number one, <coughs> be aware that you are needed on campus. You are carriers of powerful ideas and you can you to, to carve your place in campus because of your worthiness, not because you are begging for protection or begging for to be tolerated or to be part of this. You have something to contribute. You are carried of two powerful ideas. The number one is the survival of the Jewish people and, uh, and their resilience. And number two, the idea of auto-emancipation. These are powerful ideas that other minorities on campus should and could learn from. And you should understand that you have something to offer. Plus, arm yourself with one, self-worthness. Number two, facts and figures. Our enemies have learned their facts and figures to perfection, and we have neglected them. And each one of you should be able to quote the 10 most important events that, um, that, that led to the establishment of Israel, the 10 most important sins and uh, human rights violations committed by our adversaries and um, making them, expressing them in the language of left-leaning audiences. And that's very important. Use the words, religion doesn't have any monopoly. Use the word, we are equally indigenous. It's a powerful word, powerful punchline. Equally indigenous. How, how more liberal can you be if you're offering your adversary equal indigeneity? And of well, course, I have many more. If you want some more punchlines, read my op ads. They are on Judea Pearl op ads, okay, from 2001 to 2020 on my website. And, and uh, we know that you're a, such a wonderful writer and speak to the hearts of people on the left and on the right. Um, Judea, it has been a complete pleasure having you. We may have to do a Judea Pearl uh, part two, uh, and, and continue this amazing conversation. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for being so generous with your time. And uh, we have learned so much today. So thank, <laughs> thank you. It's thank great you for to be being with, with you. Us. Thank you for being with us. Take care. In two weeks, we have another terrific show for you. We'll be joined by Murray Greenfield. Murray Greenfield is a humble Israeli war hero. Murray became one of 250 American volunteers who sailed to rescue Jews who survived the Holocaust. We look forward to hearing his incredible stories. Don't forget, we are live every second Sunday. If you've missed any of today's show or any of our other previous interviews with Ambassador Mark Regev, Colonel Richard Kemp, Ambassador Danny Danone, Ambassador Michael Oren, and so many others, go to standwithus.tv, where you'll find a host of great video content available at no cost any time of day. If you love the work of Stand With Us, don't forget to support us at standwithus.com forward slash donate. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you for standing with us and Shalom from Stand With Us.